who's been given everything on Christmas. And we step back and we say, is that it? Is that it? Is that all you got? My friend, if all he ever does is walk these dirty streets as we do, if all he ever does is suffer as we do, if all he ever does is die on Calvary for the sin of humanity, my friend, that is enough. And there is no bread, there is no possession that can compare. And at the end of the day, we look at the good gifts of God that he's given us and we don't say, is that all you got? We say, thank you, God, for daily bread, for provision that carries us day after day after day. Lord, would you give us this day our daily bread? in our rabbi series and this morning we are going to be looking at a message entitled Our Father. We just celebrated Father's Day and Father's Day is a unique holiday. Matter of fact, it is one of the least celebrated holidays on our calendar. Of course, first and foremost, Christmas is celebrated. Secondly, Mother's Day is celebrated. Matter of fact, Father's Day ranks around number 20 in celebrated holidays, even behind Halloween and uh, Arbor Day. And so trees are celebrated more than fathers at times. And so masculinity, fatherhood is something that has always mesmerized me um, because I am a father, I am a man, and as a boy becoming a man, um, having a father, becoming a father, you walk through all of the nuances of what it means to be a father. And I look back now at my life as a young man, and I understand that I really didn't appreciate my father enough. Um, he worked really hard, and he went above and beyond to supply uh, a life for the family and to do good for us. But be, to be honest, in the moment as a boy, I didn't appreciate it. My father was busy. He worked really hard. He was a blue collar guy. Woke up every morning to the grind, going out and working at Ecker Drugs and getting up at five in the morning and putting on his boots and going to work and coming home worn out and exhausted only to, to, to collapse in the recliner, to veg out in front of a, a sitcom or news for the evening, to fall asleep and then drag himself to bed and do it all over again. The reality is now as a father, I understand the grind that it is. I understand that that in and of itself is also service to your family. In the moment, I didn't realize it. I never sat down and said, Dad, thank you for the cold air in the house. It's just not something that we do. Dad, thank you that we have running water and that the water bill is paid. Those are things that we just expect. But the reality is my father provided it. Today, we're talking about our father, taken from the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 14, and we're going to be looking at this concept of the Father. And if we're going to talk about our Father in heaven, then we need to understand the word Father. It's a word that in our day um, has many definitions, many opinions on what a Father should or shouldn't be. Matter of fact, there's a new phrase that's out called toxic masculinity. The reality is there's, there is toxic masculinity. There's toxic femininity. The reality is this. There's toxic humanity that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that there are none righteous, no, not one, that the real problem is sin and not masculinity, that the real problem is sin and not femininity. It is sin attaching itself to these things and contorting them just like sin does to everything. It takes something that's good and perfect and given by God in its natural order, distorts it and perverts it and makes it into something else. We see it um, in regards to sex and the perversion of sex. The beauty of sex is given to, to, to a man and a woman as established in the garden 
the beauty and the gift that it is that God has given us that then has taken something beautiful the enemy has and contorted it and made it into something different. Well, the same thing happens with everything in life. There is nothing that is not soaked with the sense of exile. There is nothing that is not touched by sin on this earth except for one who walked through this earth whose name was Yeshua, our rabbi, the teacher. And on this day, he's teaching and he says, our father. So when you hear our father, what do you hear? Do you hear abuser? Someone who abandoned you when you were young? Do you think of someone who didn't have time for you, who didn't show up to your games? Who had a, a vicious temper? What do you think of when you think of father? Father. Well, in its a natural order, the word father is, is a good thing. In its natural order, the Bible says that he created them in his own image. And in his image, meaning God, he created them male and female. There's something about the purity of the original origin of man and woman. That the femininity of woman and the, the mercy and the grace and the, the beauty that's encapsulated in woman. That there is something that, that mirrors the beauty of God's compassion and God's mercy. That when we think of a father in its original form given by God as a provider, as strength, as someone who comes alongside and encourages then through these two, femininity and masculinity, we, we have an image of, of, of the beauty of God's mercy, of his strength. We see the full scope of that. But the enemy has contorted it. So when we start a prayer like our Father which art in heaven, how do you perceive God in heaven greatly depends on how you perceive your Father on earth. And many of us are going to have to get to a point where we can overcome some boundaries and some barriers because of our lifestyle and where we've come from and our upbringing, of the way we've perceived our Father. God has not abandoned you. God is there for you. And He has given us fathers and mothers in their pure form, untouched by sin, as an example of who He is. But the enemy, once again, contorts, distorts, and destroys. Well, we're in our rabbi series, and we're talking about the teacher, Jesus, our rabbi. We are the apprentice. We are the padawan. We are the learner. He is the teacher. He is the rabbi. And so, in many cases... Disciples would, would learn prayers from their rabbis, prayers they could recite, model prayers that would allow them to pray correctly. And this situation is no different. Jesus' disciples ask, teach us to pray. John the Baptist's disciples, they, they've been taught how to pray by John the Baptist. Will you teach us how to pray? And so Jesus Begins to teach them how to pray. But he starts in verse 5 by really setting some parameters to what prayer is and what prayer is not. So first of all, if you look at, at verse 5 and really through verse 8, it's going to give you um, an example of what prayer is not. So let me, let me begin to read a few of those uh, verses for you. In Matthew chapter uh, 6, verse 5. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, because they love to pray while standing in synagogues and on street corners, so that people can see them. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But re whenever you pray, go into your inner room, close the door and pray to your Father in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the Gentiles, because they think that by their many words they will be heard. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So, pray this way. 
So first of all, before Jesus shows us how to pray, he's going to say, let me tell you what's not prayer. And he's going to point to some things that they've seen in their own communities. He's going to point to people who are praying openly in synagogues. This is the, 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 the hub of faith of the Jewish community in their area. And so this is where they, they flock to to understand the law and the prophets. And Jesus is saying, do you understand that the, some of those individuals that are praying in the synagogue, that are praying these long, illustrious prayers, are praying to be seen by men and not by God? He's going to announce what prayer is not. It is not talking to God in front of other people. It can be that. He's going to announce that there are individuals that are praying publicly, that are praying to receive their word on earth from men, to receive accolades and congratulations. A pat on the back to say, man, you're sure godly. You see what's happening here? Jesus is rebuking those individuals. He's saying that there are people who pray out in the open streets who do it to be seen by men and not by God. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to God or are you talking to men? Prayer is talking to God. And so these men are out in public and they're, they're, they're supposedly talking to God, but what they're really doing is saying, hey, everybody, look at me. I'm spiritual. I've achieved something and I'm, I'm godly. Hey, everybody, look over here. Jesus would tell you, they have their reward, congratulations. Somebody thinks you're great, good job. The reality is, it's not about our greatness. It's not about our glory. What's happening in that moment is what's meant to glorify God is glorifying man. <laughs> the very avenue meant to exalt a holy and a righteous God is meant to say, look at me and how holy and righteous I am. My friend, that is not prayer. If there is more prayer in public than in private, your prayer is hypocritical. Let me say that again. If there's more prayer in public than there is in private, your prayer needs to be reanalyzed. And you need to ask yourselves, who are you talking to? God or man? What do you... Uh, uh, plan to achieve by that prayer. So before we even embark on the Lord's Prayer, this is not prayer. What you're seeing in your communities, Jesus is saying, in the synagogue, in the public square, that's not it. Let me tell you what it is. And then he embarks on teaching his disciples the Lord's Prayer. He starts by saying, our Father. He doesn't say the Father. A father, he says, our father. In this prayer, acknowledging the community of faith, acknowledging the brotherhood that's sitting around listening to Jesus teach on prayer, that this is our brotherhood, this is our father. We are brothers and sisters in Christ and he is our father. He's not just a father. There's, there's, a, there's an ownership that he is my father. But the question is today, as we understand in our opening, how do you perceive a father? Let me read to you a poem by Edgar A. Guest, and it says this. I believe this is a, a poem spoken at a father's funeral, and I can relate understanding my father's work ethic. My father's still alive and a, a man of God, and I love him greatly. But this, this poem really emulates my father, and I, I can... I can really relate to this, um, but just imagine this being spoken of a father at a funeral. I understand now. I used to wonder just why father never had much time to play. I used to wonder why he'd rather work each minute of the day. Boys are blind to much that's going on about them every day, and I had no way of knowing what became a father's pay. All I knew was when I needed shoes, I got them on the spot. Everything for which I pleaded, somehow Father always got. I wondered season after season why he never took a rest. 
in that I might be the reason that I never even guessed. Rest has come. His task is ended. Calm is written on his brow. Father's life was big and splendid, and I understand it now. As a father, I look back at my father's service to our family, and I appreciate it now. I didn't then. Matter of fact, I, 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 I had much resentment growing up because I felt like my dad wasn't there at ball games or father-son campouts, and many times he wasn't. He tried to be, but it was because he was working. It's a blue-collar worker, grinding it out day after day. I show love by service. And my dad shows love by service. It's one of the hardest ways to receive love. It really is. It, 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 it's, not as, it's a lot easier when someone looks you dead in the eye and says, I love you. Or when someone embraces you and, and touches and, and embraces and brings you in. That, the touch and the feel that shows love or the words that show love. But many times acts of service are overlooked as a sign of love. But the reality is the person doing the acts of service, like my dad, grinding it out day after day. I get it now. Because when I'm fixing plumbing at the house or I'm painting a room or, or running drywall or whatever it is that I'm doing to try to create a, a life for my family, a home, I do that as service to my family and love toward them. So I look now at the beauty that was my dad. Yes, my dad was severely flawed, and I promise you I'm much more flawed. But I look at the beauty that was him. I look at the hard work and the love and the compassion he had toward his family. And my friend, I can appreciate it more than ever. And I can look to the original purpose of masculinity and who my father was. And I can appreciate him and I can celebrate it now. And that's probably why Father's Day is one of the least celebrated holidays. Because we don't realize it until it's too late. And like Edgar A. Guest says, it appears that, that this individual didn't realize it until it was too late, until calm was written on his brow. So we start off by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. How does the prayer start? How does the rabbi teach his disciples to pray? He doesn't come with a laundry list of needs and wants. It, it starts, yes, there are going to be needs, in this prayer, but it starts with worship. Do you hallow his name? Do you reverence his name in worship? Do you bow in your heart toward him when you approach? Do you realize that he is the God of creation and that we are but men? For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To begin to start to know that he is God and I am not. That he is big and I am small. That he is capable and I am incapable. He is God, our Father. And we will hallow his name. We will respect his name. When my dad came to the table, there was respect for my dad. He worked hard. My dad got the big piece of chicken. At the table. My dad had the seat at the head of the table as the patriarch of the family. He, there was respect given to his name. How much more so our Father, which art in heaven? How much more should we worship his name? How much more should we hallow his name? Should we honor him? And when we catch a glimpse of him, say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Woe is me. I'm a man undone and a man of unclean lips. Let it be said as the prophet Isaiah did. This hallowed reverence of Father God who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. We start prayer by worshiping God, by acknowledging who he is in this interaction our Father, 
which art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Hmm. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we're speaking of kingdoms, then there, there is an opposing kingdom. If there exists a kingdom, there exists an opposing kingdom. There is a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness. And if you are blind to that, open your eyes, take your phone and scroll through the recent feed and look at the state of our world. Tell me that what's outlined in this kingdom, the rules and the laws that he has outlined, tell me that's what our society looks like. Now, I'm not just talking about America. I don't care where you go. It's all marred by sin. There is an opposing kingdom. And it is a kingdom of darkness. You will be confronted with it day after day. You will be confronted with it by the device in your hand. You will be confronted with it on the magazine rack at the local store. You will be confronted with it on billboards and magazine covers, newspaper articles. You will be confronted with it from the lips of others. You will, you will see it driving down the highway as people serve materialism and worship things. Why they drag their $300,000 boat down the road with their $200,000 truck and their $1,000 trailer. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having things but I hope you see what I'm saying. And if you don't see the materialism in America, you're blind. It's worship in our rap songs. This world is a kingdom and it is not his. If anything, this is the enemy's. Woe to you, earth and its inhabitants, because the devil has been cast down to you. Woe to you, earth. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is throughout this world. His kingdom is seen so clearly. But how do you spot it? How can you spot it but through the biblical lens? Until you understand the kingdom that is God's, how can you compare it to the kingdom that is the enemies. If you're walking through this world, you will bite it hook, line, and sinker time and time again if you can't spot the enemy's kingdom. Because my friend, it is alluring. Its entire task is to capture you and to keep you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. My friend, you are ambassadors. You are pilgrims. You're, 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 you're functioning and laboring for a kingdom whose builder and maker is God. Not someone who builds with dung heaps. For his name is Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. What kingdom will you live for? And what we see here is that, yes, we're in a kingdom that is opposed to his, but you are an ambassador. You're walking through this earth as light and as salt to impact it. You are his kingdom representative. And his law is written on your heart. May the world see your good deeds and glorify your God in heaven by your service to your father. You see, there is opposing kingdoms, but this is the beauty. We can see his kingdom come on earth. We see it time and time again in conversations, in prayers, in discipleship. We see these little moments of his kingdom being born in earth, of people being born again into a kingdom that's God's. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. My friend, I pray you make that prayer today that you say it in your own life. May your kingdom come in my life here in Cash, Oklahoma, 
or wherever you may be. May your kingdom come today and may wherever my foot trod be your representative, your spokesman of love and compassion, your portrayer of truth and righteousness, your rebuke of wrong in a world that is lost. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. So God cares about provision. Now, we're not talking, you know, beef wellington here. We're not talking filet encrusted in pastry crust. (laughs) We're talking just bread. We're talking provision. And this is a constant occurrence in the Gospels. The Bible teaches us that, that it, it's harder, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the, the humble door, the small door, than it is the, to go, to get into heaven. That, that, that riches can, can weigh down and, and can capture our hearts and cause us to serve a kingdom of this world. That things can trap. He doesn't say, give us this daily filet. <laughs> He says daily bread. What is he hearkening to? He's hearkening to the manna which which came down daily. They were instructed, you do not take the manna. You do not store it up. Well, what did they do? They, They took the manna and they stored it up because they were worried about provision the next day. But God says, I'm your provision. Sufficient is the bread for today. He teaches contentment. Contentment. Isn't it so sad that we live in, a, in, a, in, in the West where, where the, the gospel is used as a means of gain? A, a, a building a kingdom on this earth. My friend, what are you reading? We serve a God whose kingdom is not of this earth. Who cares about your riches? You won't, will not take it with you. You are just a steward on this earth. You see, we we hold things loosely because the reality is this. I own a house and a property just a a couple miles away. But guess what? At some point, I'll sell that property and someone else will own it. That's not my property. My name's on the deed. I'm just stewarding. I'm just holding it for a little while. That's the reality with everything we have in life. What you have now, you will not have later. That car you just spent all that money on will rust and get dented. It's it's all going to rust and decay. If that is the focus of your prayer, my friend, you've missed the point. (laughs) Our focus is God. And yes, he provides. Yes, he provides daily bread. Yes, he's concerned about your wife holding down two jobs, watching the kids so that you can come through this program. He's concerned about that. He's concerned about provision. We see it when he multiplies the bread and the loaves. He looks at the people, man. He has compassion on them time and time again, and he heals them. He feeds them. He's concerned about our our struggle. Give us this day our daily bread. Lord, we thank you for the provision that comes from you. We we ask for daily bread. We do ask for provision, but we we embrace what you give. And when it comes to us, we don't don't look at it as something less, God. We, We receive it as provision from you. May we not be the ungrateful child who's been given everything on Christmas. And we step back and we say, is that it? Is that it? Is that all you got? My friend, if all he ever does is walk these dirty streets as we do, if all he ever does is suffer as we do, if all he ever does is die on Calvary for the sin of humanity, my friend, that is enough. And there is no bread, there is no possession that can compare. And at the end of the day, we look at the good gifts of God that he's given us. And we don't say, is that all you got? We say, thank you, God, for daily bread, for provision that carries us day after day after day. Lord, would you give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. 
as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. Here we have the, the, the forgiveness of sins, but, but it, it's going to put it in our laps as well. We see in Scripture that, that if, if we can't forgive our brother, then, then why would God forgive us? He tells this parable about a man who is owed money. The man who owes him money, he, he confronts him and says, you're going to need to pay this back or I'm going to throw you in prison. Well, the guy pleads, says, please don't send me into prison. I'll get your money. The one who was owed the money relents and says, okay, I'll give you some time. So the guy that owed the money, he went and he gets all the people that owe him money. He beats them and throws them in prison and demands money from them. What's going to happen when the original individual who was owed the money hears this? Jesus tells the story, and I'm paraphrasing it in my own language, but this is the gist of the story. What do you think that guy's going to say when he finds out that he showed mercy to someone who's, who's showing judgment and wrath to everybody else? How do you think he's going to respond to that individual? Do you think he's going to forgive him his debt when he can't forgive others? No. If you want forgiveness, then you need to forgive those made in God's image. You need to realize that you're no better. And if we can't get to that place, we haven't even started. For we have all sinned and fallen short. So we realize that in order to receive forgiveness, we also are implored to give it. And isn't this beautiful? That we see, that just as we looked at in our past rabbi message, that, that Jesus claims to have the power to forgive sins. He's making this line of delineation between just this everyday forgiving of others and something that the religious individuals have such an issue with that they purport that he is claiming to be God because he claims to have the power to forgive sins. So there's something else going on here that is not just brother to brother, that is beyond, that is eternal, established in the heavens. Salvation, forgiveness for humanity. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I love this because... It ends practically, in a practical, in, in this practical place where we, we've talked about provision, we've worshipped, and we've acknowledged opposing kingdoms and His word, and that we're going to align ourselves with His kingdom. We've forgiven others, and we've forgive, and been given forgiveness ourselves. But now practically, we look at our day and we say, Lord, lead me not into temptation but deliver me from the evil one. It's acknowledging the source of evil. It's acknowledging the source of the kingdom of this world. Lead me not. I'm going to go into this kingdom of this world today. I am your ambassador. I am salt. I am light. Lead me into this world. Would you remove the stumbling blocks that would cause me to stumble? Because I realize that, that I'm not perfect and I have failures and flaws. And I need you to provide a ground that's stable for me to walk on. Would you remove the stumbling blocks from my path? We've heard it said from this pulpit time and time again. Create your environment because your environment will create you. Some would say this, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. We've heard all of these statements, but there's, there's, there's truth to this. There's truth to this. That, that there are environments that are safe for us. That, that we do not want to be led into temptation. We're not going to flirt with that idea to go and throw ourselves in a bar scenario when we were an alcoholic for 20 years. Probably not a safe ground to walk on. And my friend, if you wake up in the morning and that is your prayer, lead me not into temptation today, what happens when you face temptation? When you started that day with the wherewithal to overcome it? How do you think you're going to approach it the same way you did that morning? Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from this temptation. Because, my friend, he will always provide a way of escape. Lead me not 
into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Jeremiah, the prophet, would even take it further and tell us that our heart is deceitfully wicked. So we acknowledge there is an evil one that is of the kingdom of this world. But there's also a heart that is a great ally to the kingdom of this world because our heart is deceitfully wicked, because it longs for materialism, because it longs for things, because it's marred by sin itself. We wake up in the morning with the wherewithal to understand that we're walking into a kingdom that is diametrically opposed to His. And we say the prayer, Lord, would you guard my feet as I walk through this world? Verse 14 in closing, For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins either. We see throughout this chapter, he's going to talk about how not to fast and how to fast. He's going to talk about how to pray and how not to pray as we just looked at. He's going to talk about how to give, storing up treasures, and how not to give, how to live, um, how to not worry, how to not judge. This is our rabbi teaching us to pray. So when we pray, may we pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we ourselves have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God bless you.